Well, cooking is one of just the huge um, influences on the availability of energy. And ultimately, cooking does much more than provide energy, but the first great thing it does, which uh, has not amazingly been appreciated until very recently, uh, is that cooking gives us more energy than uh, eating our food raw. And when our ancestors first learned to cook, then the great huge initial impact would have been that they got so much more energy that they would have had more babies than they had before. And their babies would have survived better. And the adults would have survived better. Be simply because they were able to eat more and uh, have uh, more regular menstrual cycles and put more energy into the immune system. So the first big thing about cooking is it gives us a huge increase, but we don't know yet how much, uh, but a, a big increase in uh, how much energy we get out of our food. When I was studying chimpanzees, I would normally take sandwiches with me, but there were days when one, for one reason or another I didn't. And because I was studying the feeding behavior of chimpanzees, I would um, regularly eat what they ate. In fact, I ate everything that they ate that I could find. And on the days when I didn't have any uh, prepared food with me, I would try and rely on what they ate. And you can eat it in the sense that you can chew it up and, and try and swallow it. Some of it is very strong tasting, which is kind of code word for really unpleasant. And uh, some of it is okay, uh, but uh, it was not possible to find anything that I could fill my stomach with. Well, the, the short story is that uh, I realized after a bit that I simply could not get enough energy out of a chimpanzee diet. And then I started thinking, well, what, what would be the best place that you could get a raw diet in the wild? And there may be better places than a chimpanzee forest. I don't think there are many. Um, and uh, this set me off looking for the difference between um, humans and other animals in terms of their ability to survive on raw food. And I fairly rapidly discovered that uh, although there are some myths that go in the opposite direction, uh, humans are different from every other species because we have adapted biologically such that uh, we cannot survive on raw food in the same way that other animals can. In some ways, I shouldn't say we cannot survive, but, but we, we can't survive in the same way other animals can in this sense that whatever environment we're in, raw food is an unsatisfactory source. And the most dramatic example of this is that in the best study of the people who choose to live on raw food uh, in um, modern urban environments, uh, which is a great way to lose weight and can be very healthy and uh, takes a lot of will, but is nevertheless, it's got many admirable aspects. Um, but in the best study of people who do that, then um, first of all, a high proportion of people suffer energy shortage. They just are not getting enough energy to be able to maintain their bodies well. And uh, the most dramatic point is that half of the women who eat all of their food raw are amenorrheic. That means that their ovarian system is closed down completely. Now, uh, this is despite the fact that they're under ideal conditions. They're eating the best possible kind of food. It's been domesticated. It's uh, no seasonal food shortages because they're eating from the global food resource. So, uh, when it's not available in Germany, you can get it from Israel. Um, they're uh, eating food that is processed by blending and grinding, and many raw foodists allow even drying up to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they're taking relatively little exercise compared to if you're out there gathering in the hot sun. So despite all these advantages, still 50% of women living on an ideal raw food diet are unable to make a baby. In fact, it's more than 50%, because those are the 50% that are completely amenorrheic. Whereas the chimpanzee on that diet will be pumping out babies. So humans, there's clearly something different about us. And we actually know what it is. You know, compared to other primates, we have tiny uh, intestinal volumes. <coughs> compared to other primates, we have these very small guts and we have very small teeth. So these are signals of an adaptation that occurred in our evolutionary past to 
losing the ability to eat raw food. Why should we do that? Well, because we were eating cooked food and the cooked food was great for us. We didn't need raw food anymore. So get rid of the ability to do it. And that's what we did. So we've been committed to eating cooked food for a period of time that is still under dispute, but I think it's 1.9 million years ago. There's this fascinating uh, set of possibilities that relate the size of the brain to um, what has happened to the reduction of our guts. And the background for this is that in order to understand how brains get big over evolutionary time, you have to think both about the advantages of being smart, because that's why you have a big brain, of course, uh, and the um, costs of fueling the brain, because uh, though our brains uh, represent only uh, was it 2.5 percent of our, the weight of our body? They represent about 20 percent of our basal metabolic rate. So they are disproportionately hungry in terms of the amount of calories they consume, and that means that to have a big brain, you have to supply calories to it at a high rate. So how do we do that? Well, is it by having a high basal metabolic rate? Not at all. We have exactly the basal metabolic rate expected of any other primate. Is it by uh, taking some of the energy that we use to feed some other organ and supplying it to the brain? Yes, it has to be. So which organ is it? Well, in the primates, the only way that they can uh, find energy to give to their brains, as it were, is, I shouldn't say the only way, but a major way is through reduction of the size of the gut. Those primates that happen to have small guts because they happen to be uh, evolved to eat a, a high-quality diet, are able to have some spare energy that they would have used for bits of the gut they no longer have, and they divert that to the brain. In other words, primates with small guts have big brains. Well, we have the smallest guts of all. We have the biggest brains of all. So it looks as though there's a connection there, and since the reason for our small guts is the fact that we cook, that suggests that it's cooking that really facilitated this, and by the way, the uh, time when our brain really takes off in, in size was about uh, two million years ago. The reason that it looks as though we started cooking about two million years ago is that it's, it's around that time, 1.9, that you first see evidence of um, our ancestors having two signals that are associated with um, a small gut, and that is a, a narrower rib cage and a narrower pelvis. In addition, you have, for the first time, or no, not the first time, but at that point you have the biggest drop in the history of human evolution in the size of the teeth, the chewing teeth. Well, that's associated with another effect of cooking, which is it makes your food softer. And because it makes your food softer, you don't need big teeth. Small teeth seem to be an advantage because, uh, maybe because they're less easily damaged than big teeth. So that happens then. And there's a third thing that happens around the same time, which is that uh, this is the point in our evolution when we stopped being ape-like in the sense that we abandoned the, uh, uh, the morphology of the shoulder and the um, upper arms that allowed us to climb. Now, for the first time, boy, we look like us. And that means that we're not very good at climbing in trees. Well that means that we slept on the ground. And how are you going to sleep on the ground in the middle of Africa with elephants and rhinoceroses and lions and leopards around? The only way that you would be willing to sleep on that like that nowadays is with a fire if you're out in the open. And so that suggests that that was a time when our ancestors first controlled fire, enabled them to sleep on the ground, lose their climbing adaptations, uh, soften the food, get the teeth smaller, uh, to, the food became much more digestible, and they could have a smaller gut. So those are all the things pointing to cooking emerging immensely older than people used to think. I and mean, people used to think, maybe 200,000 years ago. But when I was saying 10 times as far as that. Mm -hmm.